This news is funded by viewers like you. Please support our work at democracynow.org slash give. The head of Hamas's political wing, Ismail Hania, has arrived in Cairo, Egypt, for talks as hopes grow that a new deal could be reached for a ceasefire and the release of more hostages. Israel's bombardment of Gaza began 75 days ago, on October 7th, just hours after Hamas's attack on Israel. Health authorities in Gaza say at least 19,600 Palestinians have been killed so far. Thousands are feared to be still trapped under the rubble. Just before this broadcast, Israel struck residential buildings in the southern city of Raha, near the Kuwaiti Special Hospital. A reporter from Al Jazeera, Hani Mahmoud, was on the air when the attack occurred. As we're, we're getting into. Did you hear that? Yes, yes, we did. Oh, oh my God. Oh, Lord. That's the hospital. That's the hospital. That's the hospital. Oh my God. Uh, are you guys hearing that? Yes, we are. We are hearing that, Henny. Are you, are are you, you okay? Are you, are you in a safe no, place no, to, to continue to no, talk no, to us? Why, why, Hani Mahmoud asks the Al Jazeera reporter. Al Jazeera reports the Israeli attack destroyed a large mosque in Rafa, as well as two residential homes. Israeli drones had been seen in the sky just before the strikes. Earlier, an Israeli attack on the Jabalia refugee camp killed at least 46 Palestinians and wounded dozens. The United Nations Security Council is expected to vote on a new Gaza resolution today. The vote was postponed Tuesday, after the United States voiced opposition to a draft of the resolution. On December 8, the United States vetoed a U.N. Security Council resolution calling for ceasefire. This all comes as tension is growing in the Red Sea. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin has announced the U.S. will lead a new military task force to protect ships in the Red Sea following a number of attacks by Houthi forces from Yemen. We're joined now by Rashid Khalidi, the Edward Said Professor of Modern Arab Studies at Columbia University here in New York. He's the author of several books, including his latest, The Hundred Years' War on Palestine. His recent opinion piece for The Los Angeles Times is headlined, How the U.S. Has Fueled Israel's Decades-Long War on Palestinians. Uh, Professor Khalidi, I'm wondering if you can start off by just talking about the situation overall in Gaza. Your family is from the West Bank. You also have family in Gaza. And I want to just point out that I particularly talked about, named the journalist with Al Jazeera, um, Hani Mahmoud, because it has been so horrifying to only name journalists after they have been killed, and so many scores of them have died. Hani Mahmoud's bravery is astounding as he wa we watch him through um, the uh, Gaza Strip uh, and uh, today in the midst of this attack. Take it from there, Professor Khalidi. Well, he's very fortunate that he's still alive. Uh, over 90 journalists have been killed. Um, in Gaza, since in, in, we're now in the 11th week of this war, um, 283 healthcare workers have been killed, 135 United Nations workers have been killed. It's the highest death toll the United Nations has ever suffered in its entire history. Um, and that's just a tip of the iceberg. Uh, you, you cited a number of uh, 20,000 people earlier on, uh, have, apparently having been killed. Probably the number is much higher, because there are so many thousands of people buried under the rubble or missing. And we will probably not know the, the, the final death toll uh, until many, many months from now, when, when uh, operations to, to remove the ruins of the buildings that have been destroyed are completed. Um, the situation in Gaza is unspeakable. Um, what we hear from my niece's family there is, I, I, I can't describe it. It's, it's beyond belief. People are scrambling for the basic necessities of life and are sometimes not finding them. Uh, firewood to heat uh, water and, and cook 
um, enough water for everybody to have sufficient water to drink, let alone wash. Um, I, I could go on. It, it, is, it is unspeakable. It is uh, intolerable. And the, the tragic thing about it is that this is clearly intended. Um, neither our government nor the Israeli government recognize the fact that what is happening there is causing this immiseration of over two million people. Um, and, and this could easily be stopped um, and should be stopped. Um, I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't understand how uh, this country can allow this to continue. Um, the idea that going after Hamas entails the destruction of more than half of the housing in Gaza, the idea that going after Hamas entails the wounding of 50,000 people and the killing of 20,000. It's just, it, it's incomprehensible to me um, that our governments can be so callous and can be so determined uh, not to separate itself from Israel as far as this basic, the basic nature of this war, which is really directed against the people of Gaza. Over two million people have been forced to leave their homes. This is the largest displacement in Palestinian history. Uh, the killing of 20,000 people, almost half of which are, of whom are children, um, is unprecedented in Palestinian history. So we are talking about traumatic events that are going to scar generations to come. And this doesn't seem to be a matter of concern to our government, let alone the government of Israel. Well, well Professor Halliday, uh, we've seen massive, unprecedented demonstrations uh, in support of the Palestinians throughout the world. Uh, um, the majority of governments in the General Assembly, overwhelming majority, have called for a ceasefire, yet the Security Council uh, continues to be a, a roadblock, especially the United States. Can you talk about what this is doing to the legitimacy of the UN itself? Well, I think it's harming the United, the United Nations, but I think it's also harming the uh, legitimacy of the United States position. Um, it's not the Security Council that's blocking action. It's the U.S. government that's blocking action. Uh, there was one abstention, 13 votes in favor, last time that a ceasefire resolution was before the Security Council. And they spent three days trying to get a resolution which involves not a ceasefire, but a humanitarian pause. And the United States has been obstructing that, uh, as I've said, for three days. So I think this is going to harm not just the United Nations, because it's manifestly helpless in the face of this catastrophe. It's harming the United States. Um, there is overwhelming support the world over for ending this. There is overwhelming support, sympathy, the world over for the Palestinians. There is, I, would, I think the polls show, very strong support even in the United States for uh, ending this war, and at the very least for stopping um, what's going on so that humanitarian aid can get in. And the administration is clearly impervious uh, to all of this. Um, and, and I think our, the mainstream media, frankly, are complicit in this. Uh, nobody knows that four major trade unions have come out for a ceasefire. The United Auto Workers, the nurses, the electricians, uh, and the postal workers. Uh, the, that has, the, the New York Times, for example, has not deigned to mention that. Well, that's a large chunk of labor. Um, we're talking about a great deal of anger and opposition to the Biden administration's policy among wide swaths of the American people. And they just plow on as if uh, none of this mattered. I, 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 I find it very hard to explain, frankly. I wanted to ask you about, there have been numerous media reports of attacks on U.S. troops in Syria and Iraq that, that are threatening to expand uh, the conflict beyond just uh, the occupied territories in Gaza. But what the heck are U.S. troops still doing in those two countries? Has, has Congress authorized their presence there? Do the governments of those countries even want them there? Well, the government of Syria, the dictatorship of Bashar al-Assad, certainly doesn't want them there. Um, and the pretext for their being in Syria is against uh, the Islamic State. Um, I don't think there is any authorization for their being there. The troops, that are, the troops that are in Iraq are supposedly engaged in training the Iraqi army, but there's a great deal of opposition in Iraq, even though the Iraqi government has, has accepted their presence there. There's a great deal of opposition in the Iraqi parliament to the presence of U.S. forces in Iraq. And I think what we're seeing are, are, are attacks 
uh, whether from Yemen on shipping or, or firing missiles at Israel or attacks on U.S. troops in Iraq or in Syria, which are a response to what Israel is doing uh, in Gaza. And the, the same is true, obviously, of the fighting that's going on between Hezbollah and the Israeli army uh, along Israel's northern frontiers. And the fear is that this will, that this could possibly expand, that this could become a regional war. Um, so far, we're now in the 11th week of this war, since the 7th of October. And so far, that fear has been, or that, that possibility has been contained. But it is, it is always, uh, it is always there. And it would lead to, I think, possibly terrible consequences were the war to expand beyond its already quite horrific level in Gaza, and were that to spark uh, a, a further uh, increase of fighting along the Lebanese border, uh, in Syria, Iraq, uh, or, or out of Yemen. Can you talk about um, also what's happening in the Red Sea? You have a dozen corporations who say they won't ship their goods through the Red Sea. You have U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin announcing a 10-nation coalition to protect trading interests there, including Bahrain, Canada, France, Italy, the U.K., the Seychelles, Houthi officials saying that their drone and missile attacks will continue as long as Israel bombards Gaza. There is enormous anger in the Arab world about what is happening in Gaza. Um, things that Americans uh, don't see or don't see enough of, the scenes of what is actually happening in Gaza, are being watched all over the Arab world and across much of the world. And the anger that people have and their frustration at the unwillingness of their governments to do more to try and stop this. Um, is palpable. Uh, in, in Saudi Arabia, people can't demonstrate. In some countries, they can demonstrate. But you talk to anybody in any of these countries, and public opinion is boiling. Uh, and the, the passivity of Arab governments in the face of this, their unwillingness to actually take action, um, I think is, is contrasts with Hezbollah, uh, militias in Iraq and Syria, and the Houthis in Yemen uh, actually engaging uh, militarily. Uh, in, in in doing something, um, and I, I I think that I think it is really time for countries that want to have a ceasefire to begin to group together, whether Arab countries or European countries or countries in the global south, to group together and say there will be X Y Z sanctions if this doesn't stop. At the very least, if sufficient humanitarian aid, if sufficient field hospitals, if sufficient water and food and so forth are not allowed into Gaza, this and this and this will be done to Israel, which is responsible. Um, uh, and and I, think that, I think that there are countries that could do this, uh, including Arab countries. Uh, Jordan has recalled its ambassador. Well, that, that's not going to, that's not going to affect Israel very much. But uh, stopping the transportation of food uh, from the Gulf uh, to Israel, apparently the Emiratis are shipping food to Israel, would actually affect Israel. Uh, doing things that uh, threaten uh, 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 diplomatic relations uh, would, would have an impact. Now, that, that in and of itself is not enough, but I think a lot more has to be done. The United Nations, as, as we can see, is paralyzed by the UN veto, by the US, I should say, veto. Uh, the General Assembly has done what it could, 153 to 10. You can't have a more lopsided vote than that. I think more has to be done to bring home to people in Washington in particular that this is unacceptable and actually unsustainable. That the, the possibility of this overflowing into a regional conflagration, which is always there, it, it, it is only part of the damage that is being done. Whole generations are being brought up angry at the United States, enraged at Israel, uh, all over the region. And uh, Israel is going to have to deal with this for decades to come. The United States is going to have to deal with this for decades to come. We are seen as complicit. These are American. Uh, artillery shells, American bombs, American rockets, American planes, American helicopters, American artillery that are being used in this war. Uh, 20,000 people have, killed, may, have been killed mainly with American weapons, mostly civilians in Gaza. And uh, people are not going to forget that, uh, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and I don't see a sense of the impact of this uh, in Washington. I don't, I don't, I don't, I really think they live in some kind of a, of a bubble, in some kind of a vacuum in some kind of a fact-free space 
where they don't seem to understand the impact of all of this. They, they, what they're thinking and why they're, why they're thinking that is actually beyond me, as I've said. I want to ask you, uh, Rashid Khalidi, about the Hamas leader, uh, Ismail Haniya, in Egypt to discuss a possible new truce. The Wall Street Journal reporting Hamas is also in discussions with uh, Palestinian rivals like Fatah about a possible joint scenario for ruling the West Bank and Gaza afterwards. Of course, Netanyahu is completely against this. If you can talk about the discussion of the hostage negotiations, um, where we've seen reports of uh, um, <clears throat> possibly uh, Marwan Barghouti, and if you can explain his significance being released for um, a number of Israeli soldiers released. Talk about all of this that's going on right now so people can understand what's next. Well, that's a big, that's a big, <laughs> that's, that's a big number, and that's a large number of questions. I think the first thing, uh, the, the, the hostage issue. Um, there has been a, a, a huge problem around the, the hostages, because what uh, Hamas has been demanding up until now is essentially an all-for-all -all exchange. All of the prisoners and hostages. I mean, there's some of some some of the hostages are military, and many of them are civilians. And what they've been saying, apparently, from what we can tell from press reports, is that if you want all of the hostages, you're going to have to release all of the prisoners. And that is that is that is one possibility. Uh, I think unlikely. And one of the prisoners who could therefore be released is Marwan Barghouti, who's a senior Fatah leader who was convicted of multiple uh, murders uh, by an Israeli military court that he never recognized, um, and who uh, uh, might well be a candidate for president, who could win a majority of, of Palestinian votes. Um, I think the, the other issue, and, and there are other possibilities as far as hostage, hostages are concerned. For example, release of all the civilian hostages in exchange for a certain number of prisoners. And I, I have no idea where that negotiation is going. Um, some Israeli press reports indicate that the Israeli government is, is, is talking about progress when there hasn't actually been progress in order to decrease the pressure of hostage families who are demanding the release of, of Palestinian prisoners in order to get their, their loved ones home. Um, I think the, the broader question— Especially is, after Israel killed three of, um, of the hostages from Israel. Accidentally, exactly, yes. Uh, and uh, many others apparently have been killed in the bombing, and, and released hostages have said, we were terrified for our lives because of the bombing that was going on. Um, I, I've read accounts in the Israeli press from released hostages who, who've talked about how, how uh, the kind of danger that they were in, not so much from their captors, as from the possibility that they would be killed by the Israeli, by the Israeli bombardments. Um, the other aspect of this is the political uh, aspect. Uh, Hamas, uh, Hamas has a position in Palestinian politics that is not going to be eradicated, no matter what Israel does in Gaza. If Israel entirely defeats Hamas's entire military uh, network of infrastructure, if it kills every single fighter, these are, of course, probably unrealistic. But even assuming that they can do that, Hamas continues as a political movement. Hamas continues to have su support among Palestinians, not majority support, according to almost every poll I've ever seen, but a certain amount of support. If there, when and if the Palestinians manage to put together a, a government, and, you know, everybody else is going to try and do it for them, the United States is going to try and impose its uh, 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 intentions on them. The Israeli government will undoubtedly try and do the same, and the Europeans, in their colonial way, will probably try and do the same, telling the Palestinians what's good for them and telling them who they can have and not have in their government. But when and if the Palestinians can get their own act together and form some kind of, for example, reformed PLO, um, there is no way to exclude Hamas from that. This idea that Hamas, because of what it did on October 7th, is completely excluded from Palestinian governance is a fantasy, an Israeli-American-European fantasy. Um, you do not negotiate with the people who have already agreed to your terms. You couldn't do that in Ireland. You had to bring the IRA in. You couldn't do that in South Africa. You had to bring the ANC in. You couldn't do that in Algeria. You had to bring the FLN in. These are groups that had carried out horrific attacks, in many cases on civilians. These are groups that were described by the colonial power in South Africa, in Algeria, in Ireland, 
as terrorists or bandits, or they had different terms at different times. But you, the only people you really need to negotiate with are the people with the guns, after all. And in, until that fact gets through the thick skulls of people in Washington and in Paris and London, we're not going anywhere. They can pick Quislings, they can pick technocrats, they can select the Palestinians who are acceptable to them, who meet whatever test, who get down on their knees and condemn Hamas, or whatever, whatever litmus test is imposed. And those people will represent nobody, will have no credibility, will have no legitimacy, and will have no control over the situation. And so you are, you are looking barring an acceptance that you have to eventually deal with your real enemies, you are looking at a situation of unending Israeli occupation of the Gaza Strip, direct or indirect. You were looking at a situation which implies unending resistance to that occupation. How many people can they kill? If Israel claims that there are 25 or 30,000 uh, militants, uh, armed militants in Hamas, how many of them can they kill? 10, 12, 11, 15? There will eventually be others. People, people who are still there. And that means that a, an imposed solution, with Israel continuing to operate in the Gaza Strip, which it has said it intends to do, will provoke continued resistance. So nothing will be solved. And the reconstruction and the end of the misery of the people of Gaza can't take place until those kinds of changes, from occupation to some kind of Palestinian governance, uh, takes place. And I don't see, uh, you read the Washington Post, uh, David Ignatius, the idea that Arab countries are going to go in and do Israel and the United States' is dirty work for them is a fantasy. The Emiratis and the Saudis and the Egyptians and the Jordanians will not go in and govern on behalf of Israel. It is not going to happen. Uh, there has to be Palestinian governments of Palestinian territories. And that is going to have to, one way or another, involve all the groups within the Palestinian political spectrum. The Palestinians have been divided by their own, you know, but for reasons that have to do with Palestinian dysfunction, but they've also been divided by the divide and rule policies of the United States, Israel, and the Europeans. As long as that continues, this festering sore will continue, and there will be violence, and it will not only be violence caused by hard men in Hamas, it will be violence caused by the horrors visited on the Palestinians by 56 years of occupation by 75 years of colonialism, and the fact that people inevitably necessarily resist occupation. Um, you have to, they, they have to come to terms sooner or later with the fact, in Washington and in Israel, with the fact that Palestinian governance is a matter to be decided by Palestinians. Um, and that is simply not in the mindset, if you read what comes out of Washington or what comes out of Israel, of, of our, our government or Israeli government, or many European governments. Uh, Professor, we only have a, a, a couple of minutes left, but I wanted to ask you, uh, you said that there's an unquestionable connection of Judaism and the Jewish people to the Holy Land, and yet that Israel, the Israeli state, is a settler colonial project. And in your LA Times piece recently, you called it the assault on Gaza the last colonial war of the modern age. Could you elaborate? Right. Sure. Um, I mean, this goes back to the nature of Zionism. Zionism is a, a, a national project which distinguishes it from every other settler colonial movement project. But at the same time, it was a self-identified colonial project. I mean, uh, the, the Jewish colonization agency, the Palestinian Jewish colonization agency, is the term that that, that organization, which existed until 1958, uh, applied to itself. Um, that was something that was accepted by early Zionist leaders. They, they, they argued they had a claim to the Holy Land. There was a connection of the Jewish people to the, to the land of Israel. All of this is true, that, that, that there is such an attachment and such a connection. But Zionism is a European colonial project backed by imperialism, British imperialism, and which intended to replace an indigenous population with a Jewish population. As, as Zev Jabotinsky said, we want to transform Palestine into the land of Israel. And that meant a demographic transformation. And that meant a dispossession of the population and theft of their land, as happens in every settler colonial uh, scenario. So Israel is both the result of a national project, Zionism, and the result of a settler colonial project. There's no, there's no, you can walk and chew gum at the same time. There's actually no contradiction between it. And it's unique in that it was not just an extension of a mother country's population and sovereignty. It had its own independent ambitions to establish a Jewish state, not a British state. It came in under the protection of Britain, but it had its own aims. 
separate, independent aims. So it's a unique, it's a unique uh, phenomenon in, in, in the modern world. And it learned everything it did from the British. The Israeli army's earliest leaders were trained by British colonial counterinsurgency specialists to blow up houses over the heads of, of their residents, to shoot prisoners, to attack villages at night. This is British counterinsurgency, uh, uh, which, which was transmitted to uh, Israel, members of the Palmach and the Haganah in the 1930s in order, to in order for them to help the British fight the Palestinians. And that, those are the founders of the Israeli army. Moshe Dayan was trained by British counterinsurgency specialists, Yigal Alon, uh, Yitzhak Sadeh, well, many of the leading uh, figures in what became the Israeli army have that training. And Israel is using laws left over. The, the, the 1945 defense emergency regulations, under which people are put in administrative detention, no indictment, no trial, no conviction, nothing. They're just put in jail and kept there. That's a British 1945 emergency regulation. That's a typical colonial instrument. So this is a colonial war uh, fought in order to maintain the supremacy of this group, which has taken the country over at the expense of the indigenous, popular, indigenous Palestinian population. Um, the connection of the Jewish people to the land of Israel is, in my view, incontrovertible. Um, but that in and of itself doesn't justify the colonial methods uh, that have been used in the establishment and the maintenance of Israel's supremacy over now the entirety of Palestine from the river to the sea. Rashid Khalidi, uh, Edward Sayed, professor of modern Arab studies at Columbia University, author of a number of books, including The Hundred Years' War on Palestine. We'll link to your opinion piece for the LA Times, headlined How the U.S. Has Fueled Israel's Decades Long War on Palestinians. Democracy Now! is funded by viewers like you. Please give today at democracynow.org/give.